Hello and good evening, everyone. A very warm welcome to you. We're so glad you're able to join us tonight for this presentation of researching the history of your New York City building presented by Village Preservation's very own research and preservation team. Before I hand it over to them, if you're unfamiliar with Village Preservation, I'm William, the Director of Programs here at Village Preservation. And Village Preservation was founded in 1980, and we work to document, celebrate, and preserve the special architectural and cultural heritage of Greenwich Village, the East Village, and NoHo. We've secured landmark designation for more than 1,250 buildings in our neighborhoods. And we host over 75 free programs a year just like this. So please, if you have a moment, go ahead and scan that QR code that you see on your screen there. We are a members-based organization. In order to bring you these types of programs, we very much need your support. So please go ahead and scan that QR code or in a minute to go to villagepreservation.org forward slash donate or just head over to villagepreservation.org just to learn a little bit more about all the incredible things that we do. Now, one more thing before I hand it over to our preservation and research team. Next, this coming Wednesday, February 28th at 6 p.m., we are going to have the Artist Homes and Haunts of South Union Square Talk, also a webinar. If you have not already signed up for this program, registration is required. Please go ahead and go to villagepreservation.org, go to the events tab, and you will see it listed there in February events, and you'll be able to register there. So now I'm going to hand it over to our preservation and research team. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and let them introduce themselves. Hi, everybody. My name is Chloe Reguar, and I'm the research and preservation associate at Village Preservation. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Dina Taswinter, and I'm the director of research and preservation here at Village Preservation. Um, kind of here in a support capacity today as Chloe, our research associate, has done a fantastic job uh, putting a tutorial together for us this evening, but she and I both will be available to answer questions following the presentation, and Chloe will tell you a bit more about that. One other quick thing I wanted to say is that the uh, lecture that we're having on Wednesday evening that William mentioned, I will be uh, leading that. So I hope to see many of you there. Um, but for now, I'll turn it back over to Chloe to get us started with tonight's program. Hi, everybody again. So we will now begin playing the pre-recorded program, and we will send out links to all of these resources following the program, and it will be uploaded to YouTube in the coming days. And please drop any questions that come about while you're watching the video in the Q&A box, and we will get to them at, as many as we can after the recording is finished playing. Um, thank you. Everybody, let's get into this tutorial of online resources that can be used to research your historic New York City building. Just a heads up, this is mainly for buildings. This is mainly relevant for buildings built after 1866, because that is when um, the Department of Buildings began to collect new building permits. For buildings built before then, you would have to go to the New York City Municipal Archives and um, view tax records. So. Let's jump into this. I will also be sharing all of these. We will also be sending an email out with links to all of these resources so you can research buildings on your own. So the first thing I usually do is use the New York, I tend to use the New York City, the Zola map from the New York City Department of City Planning as a kind of guide to your eye research. It is like a zoning and it is New York City zoning and land use map and it provides a lot of great information including commercial overlays, zoning districts, and stuff like that. However, for this specific tutorial, I'm actually going to turn off zoning districts and turn off commercial overlays. It works totally fine. You can totally do this with it on. I just prefer to have it off. But I will turn on historic districts and landmarks, and that just shows, highlights which buildings and areas have been landmarked in, which is relevant because it, a lot of information will be more easily available about them versus buildings that aren't already landmarked. So let's jump into the tutorial with an example. So I'm gonna use 27 Washington Square North as an example. 
and as you can see it is located in the Greenwich Village Historic District and this is what each building's page will look like and you can see that it has a block and lot number which is going to be very useful if you didn't know every building in New York City in addition to having a street address also has a block and lot number it also provides links to other city databases which have useful information including um, the building information search which allows you to see other addresses available and look up um, historic permits and stuff like that so for this specific one i have already opened up the action section which is historic permits of the building these are not visible online but you can get um, them through the new york city municipal archives um, um, block and lot folders and it's kind of sometimes not that speedy so i've also already opened up the jobs and filing section which has some newer permits that are visible and you can look through but now back to the zola map each building entry provides a year built date and i don't usually rely on this one i like to confirm this date by having another source which we will go over in this tutorial so this building this page says it was built in 1898 which is actually correct but I'm going to show you how we know it is correct. So since we know it is in the Greenwich Village Historic District, we can pull up another map, which I will also be sending a link to, which is the Discover New York City Landmarks map provided by the New York City Landmark Preservation Commission. When you go onto this map, it provides a little bit more information about each building, such as who the architect and builder is and such, so on and so forth. It also links to the designation report, which every single historic district and individual landmark has. So these have definitely gotten gradually more detailed. This is one of the earlier districts and it is very long and detailed, but not quite as detailed as the each entry is for another district, such as the, the South Village Historic District, which is down here. Let's see. Yeah, South Village Historic District. But back to 27 Washington's Fort North. So here is how the report um, looks, and you can go and find each building based off of the area. But to save us some time, I'm going to show us another resource provided by Village Preservation, which is the Greenwich Village Historic District Then and Now map, in which we have linked the designation report for every building directly to their page, along with their designation photo. So this is 20, this building in the center is 27 North and North in the 1960s when the Greenwich Village Historic District was designated and this is it in 2019. So through this page you can then access um, the designation report linked to the section that is closer to where the actual building entry will be. So if we scroll down you can see 27 through 28 has some additional information and there we go. Um, the LPC also provides a map that shows permits filed on historic buildings since 2018, which can be 2016, my bad, which can also be a useful resource. All of the designation reports that fall within Village Preservation's catchment area, which is roughly um, Houston Street to 14th Street in Manhattan, are also accessible on our website, and I will send out a link for this. But let's get back to how to date buildings. So. We've done a building that's in a historic district. I now want to bring in another example that isn't in a historic district. And to do so, I will bring in 74 Fifth Avenue. So if you go here, it has a lot of the same information, but it doesn't have that layer over it because it's not in a historic district. So this one was built in, according to this, it was built in 1910, which is actually accurate. And I'll show you how we can confirm that. So. There's another website called the Office of Metropolitan History. Don't worry, I will send a link around where you can um, search for the building permits. So we will search before Fifth Avenue. And there we go, built in 1910. This built in 1910 for Henry Horn. This page is unfortunately only available for buildings in Manhattan that were built after 1900, but I'll be showing you another way that you can research buildings when that it does not fit those parameters. So to do so, I will bring up another example, 72 Fifth Avenue, which is next door to 74 Fifth Avenue. According to this, 
According to Zola, this building was built in 1920, which is not correct. And I will show you how I know that. So if we go here, hypothetically, to search that, we can search to search the building, 72 Fifth Avenue, something comes up that is not relevant to this. It's 72 West 48th Street. So we don't need that. That's not really relevant. So we'll go back here. And this is where the historic, the New York Public Library has a, um, an archive of the New York City Fire Insurance topographic and property maps. They're often also referred to as um, Sanborn maps. And these are a great way to help us figure out when a new building was added. So for this specific building, we'll go down to Manhattan. And so we know you can just go through all of them. And to save us some time, I know that the maps of interest for this one are going to be 1893 South of 14th Street, which this building is. So I'll open that in a new tab. And with that open, I typically like to click on the build, the first page or any page really. And then I like to view the item as a book to scroll through the available pages. So if you go to the top section that says jump to and then select page, it allows you to scroll down and it gives the parameters for which page is going to be, which it's going to give the, the parameters for which page you can find the relevant information on. So for this one, we'll do, let's see, where did it go? 14th Street, 4th Avenue, Astor Place. And so this is plate 23, bounded by West 14th Street, 4th Avenue, Astor Place, Waverly Place, and 6th Avenue, which 5th Avenue and 13th Street would fall into. So based on this map in 1893 there was um, a building here but it was called the hotel lennox which we know is not the building that is currently there so currently we know that sometime between 1893 and today a new building was added to that property so we go back to the home page for um manhattan map for all the maps and manhattan and then we go down to the next available map for that area which is going to be the 1897 Manhattan map, which is in the Atlas of the City of New York. So we do that. And this one actually has an index available for that. This actually already has an index available and also has, which also has the key to the building. But I will similarly choose to view item as a book to scroll through and find out. There it is. So for this one, it's going to be, let's see if that's, yes, bounded by West 14th Street, East 14th Street, and um, West 3rd Street. So now that we have that open, we can similarly zoom in on 13th Street and 5th Avenue and see that there is a different building there than was previously there. And this is the building that is currently standing. So at some point between 1893 and 1897, that building was completed. Now that we have a more narrow period of time, we can go to the real estate record and builder's guide provided by Columbia University and view all of the volumes and years. These date from originally from 1868 and then after 1878, they began to have an index which makes it a lot easier to use. So for this particular building, we'll start with the issue that dates to January to June 1893. So you can either read online or view on a PDF. For this example, I'm going to read online and basically scroll through it you, until you find the projected building section. But I've already found that section for us in a different tab. So here we go. One second, so projected buildings. And then on the next page, as you scroll through, it's done by avenues. So this one is on Fifth Avenue. So Fifth Avenue, south of 40th Street, it's either going to be, if it's in this particular one, it'll be on page 272, 506, or 763. I previously looked through all of them and know that it is, it is on page 763, which I have opened in this tab for us. But you would just 
hypothetically scroll through this and go to page 763 and it would be there. So I also downloaded it as a PDF in order to better zoom in on the entry so you can all see it, but you don't necessarily have to do that. But there, there we go, Fifth Avenue, Northwest Corner, 13th Street, seven story brick and iron warehouse, cost 120,000, Ottinger and Corn, and the architect is Cleverden and Pretzel. Very interesting. There is also, I also like to download them as a PDF. And sometimes I download ones from other years around it just to see what might come up. And when I did that, I downloaded the one from the following year and I searched Fifth Avenue in the, I control, I control F the document and searched Fifth Avenue. And then I was able to find this entry from 1894, which is an advertisement for office space in the building, which I thought was super fun and that is the building that is currently standing, and I can show you right there with that, and I just love moments like that. There is also some other resources that Village Preservation has, and actually for this specific building, it's in our um, proposed um, South Union Square Historic District, so we've already done a lot of research for it. So you can go to any building that falls into this area that's been highlighted in gray and just see some additional information. So here you go, 72 Fifth Avenue has its own entry and built in 1893, signed by Clarendon and Pretzel. There you go. And that's the same information that was in the real estate record and buyer's guide. Additionally, if your building falls within the East Village, you can use Village Preservation's um, East Village block finder, which um, provides the building construction date and architect and a lot of other fun information for a lot of buildings around the neighborhood. So if we just click on block 463, which is, um, here it is. And if we wanted to click on 9 East 7th Street, a lot of, we can figure out exactly when it was built, built in 1867 for commercial use um, and the original owner was the Metropolitan Savings Bank. And yeah, that's basically how you date building. And I will be sending out all of these resources to all of you. All right, we are now open for Q&A. So if you have a question about presentation and research, please go ahead and drop those into the, into the Q&A box. Right, let me see here, did I cut off the video too early? Just one moment, please. So the next thing that we'll be looking at is iCards, and these provide a great historical resource of what the building was used for and different alterations and stuff that was made to it. So this one definitely varies in how much information is available on each iCard, and some buildings they are not available for, but let's get started with an example. You, can, you need to access this through the HPD online website. So unlike this, which automatically links to the web, the page of the building you're looking at, this one doesn't, so you'd have to search. So let's search 74 Fifth Avenue. And when this comes up, a whole page of information comes up. And you scroll down to the section that says Historic Image Archive, Historic Image Cards, and then click on View All. And then you click here in order to open it. Sometimes it can take a second to load, but there we go. So as you can see, it's a commercial building and it provides different. Um, just different information that it has and scroll down. And also different uses that it had over time. So classroom on each story, but I'm actually gonna bring up another example, which is 27 Washington Square North, which is also been looking at. And this one is pretty exciting. So I've already gone on and searched it and I've also opened it prior to starting this recording. So it's already up there, but this one's a little different because it's residential. And when you scroll down, it has something super fun, which is the 
a historic account of how it was laid out. This isn't necessarily when it was built, it's just when the card was taken. So this, I guess, was taken in. This was drawn out in 1913. So you can see the original layout of both the um, public, the main floor, which is the public hall, and this is where people would enter. enter. And then you can also see all how the rest of the, the building stories look and how it was all laid out. A lot of buildings, unfortunately, do not have these layouts, but many larger residential buildings I have found do have, I'm going to scroll out, have um, just the number of apartments that were on each floor over time, which can be interesting. So this one, for example, was issued in um, 1952, and it has um, three apartments on the first three stories and three apartments on all the floors, stories except for the fourth. But then there's another one issued in 1955 in which you can see that there's actually five apartments on the, at that point, there were five apartments on the first story and on the fourth story, which shows that there were some alterations taken over time. And yeah, that's basically what this resource is like. And I hope that you have, are able to find this for your building and find some insight, find it to be insightful and learn something. So the next thing we'll be reviewing is how to find historic images for your building and various different resources that you can use to find them. The first of which is going to be the 1940s and 1980s tax photos, which if you didn't know in around 1940 and around 1980, um, the city took photos of every single building in New York City. So a photo should be available of your building in this resource. These are available both on a map and in an archive. So let's get started with the map. This is the 1940s tax photo map and you can either search it or zoom into the building that you want. So I know that 27 Washington Square North is available here. And if you click on the building, um, then it is visible here. And then similarly for the 1980s one, you can zoom in and explore, click on the building you want, and it's there. You can also search it. And I'm going to use a different example to search it. I'll use 72 Fifth Avenue. So I want to note that two options come up, one of which would be Brooklyn and one of them which would be Manhattan, or depending on if there's multiple addresses for the building you're looking at, it might be a different borough. But I find that Manhattan is usually the second one. And then when you click on there, when you search it, the building that you're interested in comes up. These photos are also available in an archive which comes from the city government. And this is where the block and lot numbers come into play. So if we go to 72 Fifth Avenue, or let's start with 74, you can see that um, the block number is 577 and the lot is 42. And these will allow you to search. So let's see, block equals 577. And so you type in in the search box, you can just type in block equals 577 and lot equals 42. So when you search that, it should come up. And there you go and the 1940 tax photos and two different ones come up. It's the similar process with the 1980s one. So I just like to check to confirm I'm on the 1980s collection and then you can, it saved my search. So I'll just type it in like that, but you can search it and the photo of it from 1980 should pop up. There is something I wanna note, which comes up in 72 Fifth Avenue. Some buildings, when they have been subdivided into a co-op or a condo, they develop a new lot number, which starts with 75. So this one is 7501. And that number cannot be used to search the archive. So what you have to do is instead, I have found the easiest way to do this is search for the entire block. So since it is on the same block, it has the same lot, the same block number as 74 Fifth Avenue. And I would just type in the block number there, so from there. So block equals 577, push enter, and the entire block should pop up. But let's see, I guess it's taking a second. And for some reason it popped to 1980, but you can scroll down and find the building you're interested in. And here we go. You can see it's 72 Fifth Avenue. And this allows us to see the original lot number for the structure, which is Lot 44. So now if we search that in the corner, it would come up like there from that. So there we go. The building comes up. Also kind of interesting, if you reference the historic maps that we looked at before, that lot number will be visible. For example, if we look at the 1940s map and you zoom in on 
East 13th Street and um, Fifth Avenue. You can see that it says 44 and, and in the center of the building, and in the center of the block, it says 577. There are some additional resources, the next of which is only available if the next thing we will be looking at is the um, Landmark Preservation Commission designation photo archive. And this is where the layer for historic districts and landmarks becomes super relevant. So if your building falls into one of these districts, you should be able to search this archive and find an image of the building. And I will show you how to do so. For some reason, it doesn't come up with the Greenwich Village Historic District, but luckily you can reference the Greenwich Village Now and Then map from Village Preservation in order to find that photo. So you can just click on any photo there and find the designation photo from the 1960s. But for other districts, for example, NoHo, which is right this district here, if you click on 686 Broadway, you can search this archive by using the borough block and lot number here that I'm highlighting. And I usually just copy this and paste it into the search function. So there you go. Um, a historic image of the building from 19. This one comes from 1999 because I believe because that's when the district was designated, but will come up. And if for whatever reason the historic district you're interested in doesn't come up, I believe you can request them from the Landmark Preservation Commission. Um, the next resource is a little more general. It's called Urban Archive. And what this is, is several organizations, including Village Preservation, have uploaded their historic images and other information to the map. And if we click on any of the buildings that come in purple, there'll be some historic images and information. So here's 72 Fifth Avenue, and there's a photo of it from 1915. This one comes from Village Preservation, and yeah, and you can get a little more backstory to the building. Um, a similar resource is the old New York City map. So this is just a variety of historic images geotagged to different corners, and you can just click around and explore how they have changed over time. And I'll be sending links to all of these to you, so you can explore them on your own. The Village Preservation, we also have our own image archive with over 4,000 images that you can casually explore and scroll through, or if you're looking for something more specific, you can use the search function. And whenever doing research, I highly recommend using quotation marks. So if we use 30 Leroy Street as an example, let's see what comes up with quotation marks. We click enter. And there we go. Some historic images come up and any other information we have on the building. For example, a blog post about its history is available here. The last thing I want to go over is less widely available, but super fun. It's the real estate brochure collection from Columbia. These are date to, I believe, the 1920s to 1970s, and I typically map all of them here. I click on the corner to map all items, and I just scroll around and see what's available. And these vary based on location. Let's see what's over here. Yeah, like there's just some different advertisements for buildings when either they were constructed or at some point, and they have some floor plans. I always love finding floor plans in my research, but yeah. So that's basically it. I hope that you find these resources to be useful and you can find the date of your historic building and other information about it out there. So thank you. All right. So if you have questions on a specific building or on conducting building research in general, please go ahead and drop those questions in the Q&A feature and we will try to get to as many of the questions as we possibly can. Um, I guess I'll, I'll get started on the Q&A. Hi, everyone. Um, again, I'm Dina Taswinter. I'm the Director of Research and Preservation here at Village Preservation. Um, just in case you weren't here at the very beginning and heard me say that. Um, and so, first of all, um, thank you for being here and for uh, listening to our little tutorial there. Um, I wanted to reiterate um, that we will definitely be sending around uh, via email resources, all of the resources that you got to hear about and kind of see um, examples of just now. And um, there's also tons of information on our own website, and we will link to specifically to where you can find that as well. Um, to dive into a couple of the questions, and again, happy to try to answer whatever questions we can 
talk through some of the resources again, that sort of thing. Um, I know there are more questions coming in and I'm, and we'll answer those too. There were a couple of specific questions that um, I saw kind of early on in the presentation and I thought it would be fun to kind of use those to show you again and kind of in more detail what some of these resources look like. So um, I'm going to share my screen briefly and show a couple of things that refer to specific questions that were asked. Um, give me just half a second here. Okay. So somebody uh, specifically asked a question about uh, 139 McDougal Street. Um, and I kind of intuitively knew that that address was likely in the Greenwich Village Historic District. Um, but if you're not as kind of well-versed and in the weeds of these things as I am, um, you can always look, as Chloe had mentioned, on the Zola map, which is the zoning, the city zoning map that has all of the addresses um, and kind of metadata of basic information. Um, but here, and on that, it also tells you if something's in a landmark district. Um, since I knew that this was in a landmark district, um, I went directly to the Landmarks Preservation Commission map. And once again, both of those maps and other resources, we will send them around so you can just click directly on the links once we send it to you. Um, but just to show you what that looks like. So here is the address that someone was asking about. When you click on it on the Landmarks map, it gives you this basic information. So you can see what date the building was constructed, who the architect is, um, the current owner, various alterations, things like that. Um, and then in the second tab, it takes you to the uh, designation report, which has even more detailed information. So if you're lucky and the building that you're looking at is in a landmarked historic district, then it's really easy to find a ton of this sort of information um, because you can just go here. And, and when you click on the designation report, I'm not going to do it right now. But if you click on it, it just brings you to this report that has really, really in-depth information about every building in that historic district. Um, so that's just an example um, for whoever was looking for this exact address, or if you're looking for any other address nearby, give that a try. Um, and the other question I wanted to answer now was somebody asked about um, Edward Hopper and where that artist lived in our neighborhoods. And I thought that was a really interesting question to mention now and to say out loud to everybody here because um, to build on what Chloe was showing us, which was how to date your building and how to find kind of the origins and um, historic photographs and things like that of the um, earliest time periods of your building. We also at Village Preservation do tons of um, cultural research and people often want to know, you know, where a famous person lived or where different um, types of people lived in different buildings in our neighborhoods. And often if you um, go to our villagepreservation.org, our own website and do a search, and Chloe did show um, an example of this, of how to search, sorry, that keeps coming up, um, how to search on our website in quotes for the exact phrase you're looking for, all sorts of resources come up. Edward Hopper, we have a ton of information on him, um, but I clicked on a specific blog that did confirm three Washington Square North is where Edward Hopper lived. And somebody had said they thought that was the case, but they wanted to confirm it. Um, so yeah, those were just a couple of things. Um, I'm, I've now not had my eyes in the Q&A, but I know there are tons of other questions. So I'll take a look and maybe um, Chloe or William can jump in for a moment while I look at some of the other questions. seems like a few of the questions people are interested in is where they could find older um, building records that that are predate some of the databases shown. Um, so I can speak to that a bit and Chloe definitely feel free to jump in um, at any point if you have anything to add to it. Um, as Chloe showed in the pre-recorded presentation, um, uh, you know, the, the first stop that we recommend is to go to that Zola zoning map because um, it links to a bunch of resources. And actually, maybe I can just share my screen again and quickly show um, an example of what all those links look like, um, because that then will link you to a few of the other places we recommended going to. So here we go. I will share again. And yes, so 
I just pulled up a, a, an address that um, happens to be in the, I think it's the either Sullivan Thompson Historic District or South Village Historic District, just off the top of my head, random address. But anyway, um, I just wanted to show you what it looks like here. So um, it'll tell you if it's in a historic district. And again, one of the very best resources to look up older information is through the LPC Landmarks Preservation Commission map and designation reports that I was just showing a couple moments ago. And we will send around the link for how to directly get to that page. Um, but then other things you can see here, um, this building as, you know, it says it was built in 1904. This Zola map has kind of approximate information sometimes. So as Chloe shared previously, and as you all can go back and watch at your leisure, um, we have a lot of details on how to verify that. But in terms of looking up um, older information, um, one of the things that Chloe showed us was the I cards, which I believe that's short for historical image card. Um, and you can get to that. And, and ag again, some of these resources take a while to load, and that is why we pre-recorded this. And so I'm not going to go through and do it now. You can go back and listen to it, but I just wanted to kind of explain it again and show you where it is. If you click on this link here, which is the HPD link, um, that's how you can access these I cards, historic image cards. Um, and yeah, we'll send around the resources. You can go back and watch that segment again. But that's where Chloe found and showed us the examples of um, a couple of buildings where one was commercial, one was residential. It kind of gives you that data about the origins of the buildings and their uses. And sometimes it has floor plans. Um, I will say that New York City records pre early 1900s aren't the best, <laughs> at least in terms of what's been digitized. And so it's often a little bit of a touch and go, like, am I lucky? Will this have the full information that I need? But I think a few of you who had been asking about where to find those um, those floor plans and layouts, the the most consistent place that Chloe and I have been able to find them are in these I cards. Um, one other possibility is the municipal archives. Um, and they do have some information on their website. And, and that's one of the links that we have to share with you as well. But um, I will say that a lot of these floor plans and drawings and older resources have not been digitized by the city yet. So sometimes if you really can't find it from any of these other ways, you do need to make an appointment to go to the municipal archives and see what they have there. Um, that's in terms of like finding specific floor plans for a building. But if what you're looking for is um, more like a street plan or a map or historic images, a lot of those things are available online um, and they are, Chloe showed all of those in her presentation um, and, and those are in the links that we will be able to share with you as well. Actually, there's a question on the the I cards. Will every building in the database have an I card, or will only certain of them have them? So it 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 is only certain buildings. Um, Chloe, not to put you on the spot, and no pressure if you don't know the answer. But do you know? Is is it like a certain time period that they usually have them, or is it more random than that? Um, I have seen them for most of the 20th century periodically, but it seems that larger buildings tend to have them versus like a one or two family house. I found it less likely that they would be available for that. And then the information that's available on them also tends to vary. So I, I'm not really sure. Some of them are more specific while others are more general. Yeah, I, I do agree with that, that often the kind of like you know, in Greenwich Village, we have so many um, row houses that are from the 1840s and 50s. And like Chloe mentioned, for those smaller buildings, it's more sporadic to find those I cards. And so um, I my my inclination is that I think it wasn't consistently done until kind of more the, at the turn of the century and beyond. And that's when those larger tenement buildings and apartment buildings started to be constructed and they kind of kept record in a different, the city kept record in a different way than they used to. And so that's why, um, yeah, if if it's an older row house, it's less common to find it, which, 
makes our work at Village Preservation um, more uh, time consuming and, and interesting at times too, because that's a lot of the, the neighborhoods that we work in don't necessarily have all of that um, digitized old information. And for ownership of buildings, as it changes hands, what is some of the best ways to to track that as, as ownership? And someone is asking about religious buildings, for example, as it may be hands over to different religious groups or even to a non-religious owner. That's a great question. Um, I, I see that somebody else in the in the Q&A mentioned ACRIS, A-C-R-I-S. Um, I, I always call it ACRIS. I don't know, sometimes you see these things in writing and you don't know how to say them out loud. But at any rate, that is um, an online database that the city holds that has all of the, not all of, has many of the um, deeds and mortgages and those sorts of documentation. Um, it's a little bit, depending on the building and, and both how old it is and how large and how many times it's changed hands, it's a bit of a monster to weed through sometimes um, because it, it there's like tons of information that's held there every time um, a new document like that comes into play for a building. Um, so the information such as the changing of ownership and that sort of thing should be in there, but it sometimes takes a bit of digging to find what you're looking for. It helps if you can um, maybe by some other avenue, narrow down the date range that you're looking for, or if you happen to know kind of like a, a more narrow uh, time frame that you're looking into. Um, and yeah, I mean, in terms of, you know, going from a religious property to non or from a public building to a private or that type of thing, um, I've often had a lot of luck looking at the New York Times archive and the time machine, which is there um, if, if you haven't check this out. It's it's really interesting. You can find like articles from many years ago um, and you might need a subscription to do that. So that's part of why we didn't get into it too much in this presentation, because we wanted to focus on information that's freely available to everyone. Um, but I would uh, suggest taking a look at that just even to learn about the Times Machine a bit, because um, it would have kind of, you know, all of the advertisements of um, uh, when buildings went for sale and things like that. So I, I have often found um, that to be useful sometimes, but I don't know, Chloe, if would you recommend also looking at the the information that um, Columbia holds, the, the builders, I forget what it's called, but maybe you can remember. Yes, they have some older information about like property transfers and stuff like that from like the early 1900s and stuff like that. And I also see questions about accessing ACRIS and searching by the block and lot um, would be a good way to identify the specific address. And I think it might automatically link from the Zola map to the page for the building, which on it, most of the databases from the Zola map link directly to the page. But for some reason, the HPD one with the iCards doesn't. So you then have to search the address again for that. But yeah, that's been my experience. And then just using the different newspaper archives that are available online to find who lived there or who owned different properties. Um, uh, I see a question about why HPD has the I cards rather than the DOB. I think that it's related to, um, when you look at the historic image cards, it says something related to like housing preservation and development. So I think it's just the department that's always ran those image cards, I would guess, Dina, do you happen to know if you, at the top, at least it says that on the pages. Yeah. Yeah. It, I think that's one of those kind of just, um, the city designates different agencies to run different facets of these things. And a lot of this information is held by DOB, but for whatever reason, you do need to go to the HPD website to get these historical cards. Um, let's see. Oh, I don't know if you have it open, Chloe, or if you can remember, but somebody is saying they clicked through the to the HPD hyperlink and they don't see the iCard button. Do you, do you know how to tell someone to access that? Um, or if not, they can go back and watch this later because you did go through it. Sorry, I could share my screen, I guess, to show maybe. So when you're on the 
HPD page, you search a building's address. So I have some of the ones we already looked at. So I'll use 27 Washington Square North. So after you, it's because you have to enter, in my experience, you have to enter the building profile in specific by searching for it. And then when you um, scroll down, there's the historic image card section where you can then click to access it. Sometimes it takes a while to load, so I don't know. But yeah, and yeah, there's the card that you would, and when they have to show again, these, I'm going to scroll down, sorry, fast to show the uh, layout, an example of when they have a layout, it's really exciting, but unfortunately, it's not always the case. But yeah, that's how you would get that. Does that answer your question? I can't see the... Um, I think so. Great. Um, and then I'm just flipping around to to try to answer as many things as we can. Um, somebody is asking for info on 146 Spring Street. And excitingly, again, that's a location that is in a historic district. So sorry for the whiplash a little bit, but I'm going to share my screen again now to show you what happens when I search for that. So um, so yes, I searched for 146 Spring Street and you can see here, um, well, I'll, I'll click out so you can see what happens um, when you click on the footprint of the building on this Landmarks Preservation Commission map. Um, it um, This is another example where it shows you some information. Of course, um, perhaps this is part of why somebody was asking us about this building because as you can see, there's a lot of none and not determined <laughs> when you click on this one. Um, however, in this case, I would definitely recommend clicking this little arrow and then clicking on the designation report, which will hopefully have more details, um, either some of the information that you're not seeing in this first tab, or at least an explanation of why that information is missing. And maybe that'll help fill in some gaps. Um, this I just happen to know this off the top of my head from, from the work that I do, but I'm not sure if the person who's asking about that is asking because of the vacant lot next door, which is going to be a new building by um, by an architect named Annabelle Seldorf. Anyway, um, that, that speaks to another facet of what Village Preservation does, which is um, review all new projects that are coming forth in historic districts. And I just happen to have worked on that one, so thought I'd mention it. But but yeah, um, one of my very favorite resources uh, that we have at our disposal at our disposal in searching for information on historic buildings is definitely this LPC map because it's just all held here in a really central location um, and hopefully is useful. I did see a question. You did mention a building, an empty lot. So if you're researching a building that's been demolished, what are some of the best routes to go about doing that? Um, maybe Chloe can add on to this a little bit, but I, I think a really great first step, if you know the building is no longer there, and perhaps if you have a general sense of the time period, of the building you were looking for is to look at the old um, Sanborn fire insurance maps. Um, and Chloe talked about this during the presentation. And, and again, this is one of these great resources that we will circulate to you. Um, uh, one of the best ways to access this information is through the New York Public Library. They've digitized a lot of these, but um, maybe Chloe, if you wouldn't mind just reiterating a little bit of what you said already um, a while back about how to, or or what these maps can do for us. Uh, so they've taken over, they have taken over a period of time and they sometimes have um, in addition to the address, it'll have like a description of what was in the building in certain cases. For example, the one I showed it had previously been a building called the Hotel Lennox, but in um, other cases, it's less available, but you can definitely go through that um, database to, to see what was in a specific area and then do that. And I would also recommend just checking internet archives such as the Times Machine or newspapers.com to see like what might come up from there. But that's usually where I would start with the Sanborn maps for sure. Are there any other newspaper resources that you would recommend for researching existing buildings, buildings that aren't there anymore? Um, the New York State Historic Newspapers I find to be helpful. And then the Brooklyn Public Library also, I believe, has a free available research for like the Brooklyn Daily Eagle, but that would be more Brooklyn um, based. And I can send 
these out as well in the document with the resources so you can explore them there. And I believe the, the Library of Congress does also have a newspaper resource. You would just have to search by state and then, of course, city within the state. It's a little more time consuming, but it's, it's also a very useful resource. Let's see other questions. Um, I can speak to uh, this maybe is the uh, maybe is what you were referring to, William, when with somebody saying um, a question about a building that no longer exists. But I did just happen to do a quick search for it. Somebody is asking about buildings that have been demolished and specifically cites the Cedar Tavern. Um, and I just wanted to point out that if it's um, kind of either an institutional building or or a building that had a restaurant or a business, um, specifically in Greenwich Village, the East Village, or NoHo, uh, it's not, you know, all inclusive, but more often than not, Village Preservation has done um, exhaustive research on a lot of these um, iconic you know, businesses that are no longer extant and Cedar Tavern. I just did a really quick search on our website and it is one of the ones that we have luckily um, had the opportunity to research previously. So if you, um, as we suggested, if you in quotation marks, write Cedar Tavern into the search function on villagepreservation.org, um, a slew of resources will come up, various blogs and articles that we've written about what happened to that particular business. So I hope that'll be helpful for that specific question, but also just generally to everyone, if you're looking for the history of, you know, an old tavern or restaurant or or other type of business that existed in the village that is no longer with us, we often do um, have some good research on that. This question might be a good way to tie some of everything we've talked about a little bit tonight. So someone is asking about their grandmother that arrived in the 1890s and they eventually came to own 119 Sullivan. So how can we help point them in the right direction to understand how their grandparents came to, to own that building? That is a really interesting question. So um, I can think of a few different components to it. And then um, Chloe, if you, if you have anything else, definitely add your thoughts because um, she and I Chloe and I both do tons of uh, that type of research for village preservation. Um, I think when looking um, into information about a person who you know was living in the village or living somewhere in New York in a certain time period, um, definitely uh, we recommend uh, using census records. And that's not something we've had the chance to mention yet in, in this talk today because Obviously, that's more linked to the people rather than the history of a building, but the history of a person and how they move throughout the city and where they lived at different points in their timeline also tells you information about, about the building because you can trace, you know, how long somebody lived somewhere and that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, the 1890, in this case, the 1890 census could tell us where that person lived at that point upon arriving in New York and then... Um, you know, you can search um, per each decade to figure out when the switch happened and when they may have moved into the building that you're talking about that they owned. Um, in terms of figuring out information about ownership and um, that sort of thing, again, because this building luckily happens to be in, I believe it's the Greenwich Village Historic District, but if not, it's another historic district nearby um, that I'm can't think of the name of at the moment, but um, the LPC designation report usually does and should have um, kind of a timeline of how ownership changed of that building. So that would definitely help you pinpoint um, what date or at least what year that person um, gained ownership of that building. Um, and hopefully those are a few clues to send you on the right track to figure out more about that. I think this will then be our final question for the evening, but on a little bit of a different tangent, 
do you know of any resources or where folks could look for potentially researching architectural drawings and you know beyond just recent zoning drawings on the DOB website, maybe some original architectural drawings from buildings? Um, so that is, in my experience, often difficult to find. It depends on the time period. I mean, anything pre like mid 1900s um, is pretty spotty, at least in terms of what's been digitized. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I have sometimes had luck um, going in person to the municipal archives. I think you do need to make an appointment for it, but um, they have a lot of the really old, um, you know, like printed out architectural drawing sets. Um, actually, now that I say that, again, my <laughs> this is my like never ending trope, but if it's in a historic district, the Landmarks Preservation Commission has also tons of these physical copies of original architectural plotted drawings, um, but they're not digitized. So you... LPC also has something called a records access request, um, which you get to just through their website um, and you can put in the address of the building you're looking for and request to pull up any old um, architectural drawings. It's not necessarily comprehensive. You, you kind of never know what you'll get, but they usually have something. Um, and uh, for that too, it's, it's for the most part, it's the 1960s forward because that's when the Landmarks Preservation Commission uh, was created. And so that's when their kind of stronger records exist, though it's possible that they'll have some older, um, you know, pre-designation information in their own research library that they could share with you. Um, sorry, that was that was a little bit rambling, but but the reason is that it it's often hard to find architectural drawings um, from earlier than the 1950s or 60s. Um, but yes, municipal archives is definitely uh, would be my first stop for sure. Um, Chloe, do you um, have have any other thoughts on that? Or is that what you would do also? I would try the municipal archives or you could check the Columbia brochure collection if they possibly have one. But those are kind of more rare. And it's also more of an advertisement for what the original layout would have looked like. But that would be my advice as well. And, and just very quickly to answer a question that just came in following up to what I said, um, it asks, would an LPC have exterior drawings? What about interior that were filed with DOB? So if it's drawings that were since um, LPC came into existence and for whatever building you're looking at since that historic district or that individual building was designated, like for example, I'm looking up a building in Greenwich Village it was designated in 1969. I'm interested in, um, you know, an alteration that happened in 1982. Um, technically, or or at least when the drawings were filed, LPC definitely does keep record of all of the interior alterations. Even though LPC's job is to look at the exterior, um, they need to literally stamp the interior drawings and just give their stamp of approval. So. Theoretically, LPC would also have interior drawings. I'm saying this in kind of a tenuous way because I can't promise that their records are 100% um, upkept well. And so, you know, a specific address you're looking for, they may have lost the drawings or they may certainly not have them digitized or just not be able to help you in that case. But in theory, yes, LPC does retain interior drawings as well as exterior. All right, thank you. Any final thoughts before we wrap up for the evening? Any final thoughts on conducting building research, how to stay sane in a rather complicated process? Um, well, yes, it's definitely, as you've heard throughout this hour, um, often a, a tricky process depending on where your building is located and how old it is and how many alterations might have occurred. Um, and, you know, we, we went through a ton of information very quickly tonight. Um, I do recommend exploring the resources that we'll send around within the next day or two to everyone. Um, and just, I think, you know, no matter what you do and how you talk about it, you kind of need to 
dig around a little bit on your own on these different um, digitized maps and everything because it just takes time to to get familiar with the feel of these different resources. But um, we we hope that it will be helpful. And um, yeah, certainly go back and once you've had the chance to maybe click around on the Zola map yourself, go back and listen to that section of of the recording from tonight, and hopefully it'll all click a bit and and help you uh, make progress on whatever building you're researching. All right, well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. It's been a great privilege to have you join us. Dina, Chloe, thank you so much for sharing your time and wisdom with everyone. I also wish all of you researchers the best of luck as you go forward with your New York City building research. As we've stated, the recording will be shared and a list of resources will be shared as, as well. Give us about 24 to 48 hours to, to follow up with you on those resources. And please remember, Dina is also having a presentation on South Union Square this coming Wednesday at 6 p.m. But for now, good night. Have a great evening, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us tonight. Take care.